Welcome if you are just joining us. Um, what I will do while we're just waiting for a few people to join is start a little screen share and then we'll get going. There are still notifications happening. Let me <laughs> close that. There we go. Um, all righty. Okay, can we see a screen? My screen's gone all strange. Oh, hopefully that's not my fault. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> can we see a presentation? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so what I am planning to do is just to give you my kind of presentation about the program, um, an overview of it generally, and then a little picture of each year, um, and then a, a taste of what a rough kind of a week in the program will look like, um, and then some, some general advice and tips um, before, uh, things to keep in mind before starting. Um, or to keep in mind as you progress through the program. Uh, my name is Dr. Kiara Holland. I'm currently the, the program lead for this MSc, um, but I will be transitioning out of this role. So you'll see my face now and a little bit for the next few months, but um, somebody will be coming in, in into my role as well. Um, so after I've done the presentation, I will um, open it up to you guys to ask any questions that you might have that I haven't addressed um, or for a clarification on anything but feel free to um, pop things in the chat as well I won't get to them while I'm talking because I'm highly distractible but <laughs> we'll go through at the end and see what kinds of questions are there um, if they're not already addressed so welcome uh, and we'll start with a little overview. You may have already seen some of this information, but um, this program is a minimum of two and a half academic years, uh, and you have a maximum of five years to complete the program if you take it over a longer period of time. Um, we don't recommend extending it unless you have um, personal or medical needs that necessitate that. And it's something that you can do in consultation with your advisor come the start of the program or at different points um, for uh, new parents as well. This is a flexibility that we offer uh, people who become pregnant or you know, have caring responsibilities as well. The program is um, delivered by the schools of education and the schools of psychology. So the program is based within the school of psychology, but we share some of the delivery of specific courses with the school of, Psych uh, of education as well. So in some ways you might be dealing with different schools, but you as students would be situated within the school of psychology. Um, the entire MSc consists of 180 credits and that is 60 credits per year. And that equates to a total cost of £15,000. So that is uh, roughly £1,700 per 20 credits. Uh, there is a link tree here, which you may have already encountered, but I would recommend really thoroughly exploring this because it has some really, really helpful information. Um, more detail on some of the things that we'll talk about today and reiterating and then a few other things that uh, we can't capture in a single session, but will be helpful in making your decisions as well. So that link tree includes the current program handbook. It will be updated for the next year very soon. A really extensive FAQ document. It includes a program uh, recording with me giving much of the same information that I'm giving you now. Uh, it also includes some links uh, to view what the learning environment will look like, some summer reading lists and some pre-arrival information as well. So there's quite a bit to explore there as well. So what will you do on this program? In terms of courses, there are 10 taught courses. 
that um, will be covered within year one and year two on the program. Eight of these courses are core, so these are essential requirements for BPS accreditation, uh, and there's no, <laughs> there's no budging on this. And then you have a choice for two courses, you get to choose which optional course you would like to take from a list. Um, and this can change from year to year, depending on the availability of our staff. Um, but currently it includes things like a 10 credit course in educational psychology. Um, we have forensics, we have clinical health. Um, we have current issues, current issues in psychology, which captures a lot of different kind of hot topics. Um, and we have a course that is dedicated to applied qualitative methods as well. Um, I will say that the optional courses are just an opportunity to have a look at a specific area of psychology in more depth. It does not in any way, shape or form impact your later trajectory in psychology. So, for example, if you are very keen to become an educational psychologist, you might want to look at different option courses because you're already familiar with the course that you want to explore after this. Um, so this is just an opportunity to have a look at something different. It has no bearing on future study at all. And then the final year of the program is a, uh, an independent research project. That is the entire 60 credits. And that is um, supervised by a member of staff within the School of Psychology or the School of Education as well. So that is each of the three years in terms of courses. The kinds of people that you will meet, we have a hugely diverse um, student population on this program. Currently within years one, two, and the graduating year three is about 280 students, um, but 80 or 90 of those will be graduating in the next few months. Um, most of our students are studying within the UK or Europe but we do have people all over the world in lots of different time zones. Um, and people bring in a huge variety of diverse experience and prior education and prior occupation background as well. So it's a really interesting mix of a lot of people bringing a lot of experience and a lot of different skills as well. There is a core teaching team of about 13 teaching staff, but we do have administrative staff in addition to this. Um, and teaching support staff and graduate teaching assistants that might be involved in the program as well. The pictures that you see here are the, the team management. Um, so we have Dr. Zeba Ghazali Mohammed, who will be transitioning into my role over the next few months as the lead for the program. Dr. Kate Reed is our lead from the School of Education. So Kate and Zeba and I all work together to manage the program. And we have Dr. Stephen McNair, who will be the year one advisor um, and who is uh, a deputy of this leadership team as well. So when is this all going to happen? So the timings for our academic sessions um, run between mid-September to mid-July. So some semester one will take place between September and February. There are some reading weeks, there are some holiday weeks um, and some study breaks within that. And then semester two takes place between February and July. And again, there are reading week, reading week breaks and holiday breaks in there as well. So each individual semester includes 14 learning weeks or study weeks. So these are weeks that you will have content. Um, and as well as the reading week and the holiday week that I mentioned, at the end of each semester, we have an assessment period where there's no coursework, there's no new learning. These are just dedicated weeks to support you completing assessments as well. The dissertation year is slightly different. Um, it's a little bit shorter, so we just contract the number of teaching weeks. And because of the nature of the independent project, we don't have things like the assessment period um, or the reading weeks because you are just working with your supervisor. So the dissertation year takes place between September and mid to late April. Um, and then we go through the marking process and the exam board process 
and your graduation will be in the winter ceremonies in November of that same year. And you will be able to come to a physical graduation um, if you'd like to come to Glasgow and live your Harry Potter fantasy and run around in our wonderful um, older buildings. It is really lovely. It's a really lovely time of year um, to enjoy and, and celebrate with all the students. So one question that you might be thinking is why this particular program? Why a conversion MSc and why Glasgow's? Um, obviously, any conversion MSc is essential if you'd like to continue into any BPS accredited postgraduate program. There are lots and lots of different um, career pathways in psychology and in the wider psychological workforce, but many of them will require BPS accreditation, either for an undergraduate degree or a conversion MSc instead. I would really strongly encourage you to look at the career resources from the BPS because they give very targeted and very informative advice on the different career pathways. That's not something that we really do as a school. Um, so their resources and signing up for their, um, their mailing list and going to their seminars and their workshop opportunities, I really, really highly encourage that. If you are outside the UK, it's really important that you check with your local accrediting body if they recognize VPS accredited degrees and what they might need in addition or alongside a BPS accredited MSc if you choose to take one. For example, the BPS accreditation requirements are quite broad, whereas some other countries want less breadth and more specificity in certain areas. So we've had some students um, in certain countries in the EU that have needed to supplement their BPS uh, MSc with a couple of extra optional courses um, from other universities to, to meet the requirements of their local accrediting body. So I would definitely recommend checking that out before rather than signing up and um, joining the program and then realizing uh, what you would need after the fact. Doing a, a conversion MSc does not mean you are a psychologist. It means you are eligible for graduate membership of the BPS, not chartered membership of the BPS. So you can't necessarily practice and call yourself a psychologist until you have done further postgraduate training under the BPS accreditation. Um, why Glasgow specifically? Well, our program is quite tailored to the expertise that we have within our school. Um, and that includes one of the most unique things that we offer is our um, extensive work with reproducible research methods um, and data skills. Now, I know statistics and data skills might not be the sexiest selling point, um, but in, you know, in today's world, this is a highly valued skill and it's a very unique thing that sets our program apart from, from other programs. You don't need to have any prior experience in statistics or data skills or coding or anything like that. We start from the very, very beginning. And I will say, I know it can be intimidating because I was that person <laughs> not too long ago myself, but many students say that they enjoy that much more than they ever expected to. Um, and are quite surprised at how much they enjoy research methods uh, and data skills. So please don't be intimidated by, by those things. It's an opportunity, <laughs> not um, something that you have to endure. So let's take a look at each year in a little bit more depth. So within the first year of the program, you will take five courses. Um, and you can see from this table at the bottom, uh, research methods one, takes place across the entire year. And then in the first semester, you will do human development and a course called CHIP, which is conceptual and historical issues in psychology. These are both core necessary requirements for the BPS. Second semester, you will do cognitive psychology and physiological psychology, also core um, required courses. Within this first year, 
you will find it a very steep learning curve. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. The first year is often what some people find to be the most challenging because you are getting right in there straight away. You're having to learn to adapt to study within your lifestyle. It might have been quite a while since you have studied um, and you're learning how to meet the expectations of a psychology degree. Um, things like academic writing um, and these kinds of things and critical evaluation. So to support this, we offer more and smaller assessments within this first year to build your skills. The consequence of having more assessments is that it feels like there is a lot more happening often. We shift this in year two to fewer assessments that are worth 100%. Um, there are pros and cons to both, but our intention here is when you're first finding your feet and you're learning to adapt to the expectations of a psychology degree, we don't want to hit you with a 100% assessment that you really struggle with. We'd like to try smaller assessments so you can learn progressively throughout the year. Um, so that is our intention by doing things in this way. The, um, this year, we also include opportunities for peer collaboration and to get formative feedback from peers and from staff as well to support that learning development. Those opportunities are optional, um, so you don't have to engage with them if you find yourself pressed for time. You can prioritize what you want to engage with, but I would obviously encourage you as much as you can so you can find some peer support networks um, and you can get feedback early and often as you go through. But with this steep learning curve, you will bring your own existing skills and it will be about learning to adapt them to the expectations of an MSc and a psychology degree as well. But this will most likely mean learning to learn in a slightly new way. Even just shifting to learning online can be a quite a significant challenge if you've not done this before. So it's good to be really conservative with your time, really cautious um, and compassionate with yourself as well. We often see students who may have done exceptionally well in earlier degrees, uh, learning to adjust to this program and may not do as well as they thought they should for their first assessments. Those first assessments are not a testament to how you will do for the rest of the program. And we see very, very fast and steep progression uh, within the first semester and certainly within the first year. So please be realistic and conservative with this first year and just give yourself the chance to, to find your rhythm and to find your feet um, and be kind to yourself because this is usually, like I said, the most challenging part of the degree. And towards the end of second semester, you will find the best rhythm for you, the best working patterns and the best studying techniques as well before you shift into second year. So as I mentioned, there are fewer assessments in second year, but they are higher stakes. So this can be challenging for some people because it means a little bit more autonomy, which means you really have to direct your own learning and make sure that you keep yourself on pace because it can be very tempting to say oh well you know I can postpone this because I don't have anything due for three months and that can be a very very dangerous gamble um, if it then means you miss two weeks of work three four five six weeks and all of a sudden it's a very big steep mountain to climb to come back uh, from those kinds of gaps so for year two it's really important that you self-pace and you you know, put some tools in place to help you kind of manage and organize your time um, so you don't get tempted to just drift uh, and then prepare assessments in a rush at the end. Within year two, there are still lots of formative tasks um, and opportunities to engage with your peers and to engage with the staff as well. But there is this balance of a little bit more independence in this year. Um, and the overview for this year, You've done research methods one, you've done your four courses. In this year, you'll do research methods two, which takes the whole year again. Uh, and you'll also do individual differences and social psychology, 
in first semester. These are the last two core courses. Uh, and then in semester two is when you get to decide which of the optional courses you would like to do. Um, and yeah, that, that list may change from year to year, but it doesn't tend to. Uh, and you can pick which you'd like to have just a little bit of a special deep dive into before we transition to the dissertation in year three. So as I mentioned before, the dissertation takes place between September and April of this year. It is an independent research project. You will work with your supervisor. Um, you may be part of their supervision team though, so you will still have contact with other students and you can also set up your own informal support network. So this can be an isolating year, but it doesn't need to be, um, depending on how you want to work. Some people just want to focus on their thing and that's it. But there are lots of ways that you can still be part of the community and establish a support network, um, either an academic support network or just, just a social one as well. The independent research project will result in uh, a dissertation report, and that is usually around 10,000 words. For qualitative projects, it can be slightly more than this, but it doesn't need to be. As I said, this is individually supervised by a member of staff. You'll be allocated to this member of staff towards the end of your second year. We go through a process where you submit some preferences of who you'd like to work with. We run an algorithm and you are allocated to one of those preferences. Uh, and then the specifics of your dissertation topic are negotiated between you and the supervisor. And this is an, an important collaborative process because we need to work within the expertise and the experience of the supervisor to give you the best kind of support and the best chance of success with your independent research project. So I'm sure people are coming into this process with specific areas of interest and perhaps some specific um, experience based on their workplace or personal lived experience uh, or organizations that they've worked with in the community. Those things are all great and they will inform this process, but I would strongly suggest not tying yourself to a very specific idea or a very specific project because the primary role of the supervisor is to make sure that you have a project that is feasible and realistic within the time frame, because there are a lot of things that can really throw some challenges within this process. And the supervisor's job is to de-risk and to minimize those challenges as much as possible. So when you get to the stage, my strongest advice is to wait until you have those discussions with your supervisor and absolutely prioritize and heed their advice because they've done this dozens and dozens of times before and their priority is your success. There's no other ulterior motive um, behind their advice in any means. So what does a typical week look like? So as I said before, you'll have five courses for year one and year two which will mean three courses per semester. At the beginning of each year, so within the induction week of each year, we give you all of your assessment dates for the entire year. So that means you can put these in your calendar and plan around these if there are any other kind of life events happening um, or important transitions and events that are going to potentially interfere. We do not adjust these dates unless there are exceptional and unavoidable circumstances. So those assessment dates are set in stone in September. And then once you start the semester, coursework is released in two week blocks. You can engage with this content whenever you like. We release them in two week blocks to give you an approximate flexible pace. So we encourage you to engage with those two weeks of content within those two weeks. But obviously it doesn't disappear. So if you need to come back to it at a later date or revise it, it will always be there. But we give you this two week pace, fortnightly pace to give you some structure. 
within those two weeks, you can engage whatever time, whatever way you so choose. Uh, we don't do live sessions for teaching. And this is to make sure that we are being as flexible as possible. If we have live sessions, then there will always be people that can't engage and that can leave them feeling like outsiders or they're, they're left out. Uh, we do offer opportunities for live sessions, but they are never compulsory and they're always recorded as well. So lectures will never be live. They will always be recorded, but there will be things like support sessions, assessment Q&A sessions, and our academic staff have weekly office hours that you are welcome to attend to ask them any kind of questions um, that you have. So there are lots of opportunities uh, for real contact with people, but we don't offer anything synchronous that is compulsory um, to give people maximum flexibility, essentially. In terms of the weekly study commitment, based on the number of um, credits and uh, associated study and learning hours, we estimate that you should be spending about 21 hours of study per week. So that will include engaging with lecture recordings, doing some reading, um, doing some of the optional formative tasks, and potentially doing some self-study for the summative assessments. Some people have said that this is quite an accurate um, number for them. Other people, depending on your prior study um, or how recent your prior study was or your familiarity and comfort with some of the different topics, you may spend more time than 21 hours a week, particularly in the early stages. Um, this is also not necessarily constant. You might spend less one week and more another week or more when assessments are due. It does fluctuate, but in terms of how we design the courses and the intended learning hours, it comes out to about 21 hours per week. So just to give you a quick snapshot of a particular week, this is week seven <laughs> for these three courses in first semester. And what we do is give you weekly checklists for each of your courses. Um, and you can see for research methods up here, you have um, activities like reading, watching the lecture recordings, completing uh, an activity, an optional test, just to see how you're going, knowing the material. For human development, we have the same kind of thing. We have some mini lecture recordings. There is an optional group discussion if you want to engage with it. Um, and then some additional optional tasks if you want to. And the same thing for CHIP. There are some readings and some mini lectures and a couple of tasks as well. So you can monitor what you've completed as you go through. And we use these to have a check-in every few weeks or so and say, it looks like you've completed lots and lots of things. Good work, keep going. Or we might touch base and say, is everything okay? We don't see a lot of progress tracking happening. Um, do you need any support? Things like that. It's not to be big brother and to monitor everything you're doing. It's just to make sure that you are engaging um, and to check if we can support you in any way as well. So the kind of things that I've been talking about so far have been these little mini lecture recordings. These tend to be between 15 minutes, 25 minutes, half an hour-ish. Um, and then we offer weekly readings as well. These are categorized as either essential core readings or optional if you'd like further information. So we tend to pitch the content for each week at a midpoint. If you feel like you need more foundational information, you're welcome to ask for this if it's not already provided. And if you're looking for optional material that can extend your knowledge or go a bit deeper into a particular aspect, that it will usually be provided and you're welcome to, to ask for that as well. If you find a particular thing really interesting, we will always be able to provide further, um, maybe more technical readings to support that as well. So some of the things that I've been talking about have been formative activities and summative assessments. If you're not familiar with these terms, formative activities are optional things, tasks, quizzes, discussions to consolidate 
the lecture information and the readings, um, and these do not contribute to your course grade. Summative assessments do take, do con contribute to your overall course grade at the end of semester. These will differ between courses. They can include quizzes, um, portfolios of small pieces of writing and tasks, essays, blog posts, um, and research reports as well. So there's quite varied um, types of assessments that you'll experience, but they are all coursework, not traditional exams, so to speak. Um, and they will be distributed throughout the semester. The kinds of support, um, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a summary of a few of the things that you have available to you. Um, obviously, the teaching staff are um, contactable on email or Teams. We usually use Microsoft Teams as the main point of contact and the main platform to interact with staff and students. We aim to reply within 24 hours if we can, apart from weekends, but that may be, depending on busyness, um, up to three working days as well. And it will be, because we are a UK-based program, it will be within UK business hours too. Some staff may choose to work flexibly and may respond outside of those hours, but that's not a guarantee. That's up to individual staff. As I mentioned before, we have uh, weekly office hours. Every staff member has these. Um, you can attend these individually or um, as a group. You're more than welcome to come collectively if you find us too scary and intimidating. Um, and as I said before, we have support sessions and Q&A sessions for each of the assessments as well. You also have your program lead team and your academic advisor for more general things that aren't specific to a course, um, just general advice or support. There are peer as well. There's lots and lots of peer opportunities to connect. You have student representatives who can be kind of an intermediary between you and us, if you like. Um, there are lots and lots of discussions that take place online as well, particularly on Teams. Um, and on Moodle using discussion boards as well. And you are absolutely welcome to form your own study groups and peer groups. Um, in terms of university services, you have access to all the normal university services that on-campus students would. Sometimes it might just be in a slightly different way. Um, obviously the library um, and the SRC and the career service as well. The two services that are particularly helpful are the Student Learning Development Service, who offer one-to-one uh, -one advice and uh, special workshops in academic skills, um, and the disability services. If you have any um, historical or current and ongoing um, diagnoses, or if you are neurodivergent, please do register with disability services. Even if you don't think you will ever need it, it's really good to be in the system. They can discuss what kinds of flexibility and accommodations you might be um, able to take advantage of. And um, like I said, if you don't use it, you don't use it, but it's really good to be there. Don't think that you need to do things on your own. <laughs> um, the services are amazing and there's a lot that we can do to support people with, with different needs and different um, requirements. So please, please do register and have a look at those services. Nearly there, this is when my voice starts to get tired. Just some advice for um, before you start, before you apply, before you accept an offer, um, do read the program handbook and the FAQ document that I mentioned before on the link tree. Really, really be realistic with your time um, and consider how much time you do have available to you to commit to an MSc. This is not an insignificant commitment financially in terms of your own resources and your own time. Um, a conversion program is not like other part-time learning because we are trying to condense the requirements of an entire undergraduate program within to this MSc. So it is, it is by no means a small uh, thing to integrate into your life. 
Um, and you can also have a look at the summer reading list that is on this link tree if you'd like to get an idea of the kinds of materials that you'll be engaging with. Uh, if you do decide to join us, these are some uh, pieces of advice from me and from other students of how to plan for success on this program. Leave your expectations of yourself at the door, but also your expectations of what psychology is, what learning online might be, and just embrace the process and um, see what comes and just adapt to the program as you go through. Do expect to be challenged, um, possibly in ways that you don't expect, either with material or with um, expectations around writing or data skills. Uh, but every challenge is an opportunity to learn something new. I know that sounds really flippant and silly, but it is true. Uh, plan your year. Once we give you those assessment dates, really look um, at what is going to be coming. Plan your holidays, plan some rest breaks. Um, but it is really important to navigate around assessment dates as much as you can. So we can predict the predictable. And then if the unforeseen or unpredictable happens, we can deal with that as it comes and be in the best position to do that. Always communicate with us as a program, communicate with your teaching staff, communicate with your advisor. As soon as something pops up and you're like, this might be a problem, this might disrupt my progress on the program, do reach out to us. It's a lot easier for us to offer support and contingencies at the, at the beginning or at the early stages rather than coming at the end and having to try and, and fix something where our options might be more limited in how we can support you. Um, do seek support and community. This program really is what you make of it. You can just come in, do the coursework, absolutely fine, but there are really great opportunities to network and to meet other like-minded people and, and to form really long-lasting friendships as you go through as well. Um, and very importantly, part of your organization and part of your planning is also to find time to, to have opportunities for respite uh, and rest, particularly after assessments are due. Um, and just some important things to keep in mind. Um, if you change your mind or, you know, life throws some curveballs at you, um, that always has a way of disrupting our best laid plans. When, uh, if you've been given an offer, but you wish to defer your offer, you can only make that decision now. After you've registered and enrolled, you cannot defer any offers for until another year. So um, after you've accepted your offer, if you wish to defer it, then contact the postgraduate admissions team on the email that I've given here. If due to medical or personal circumstances or becoming a new parent, um, you think you might need to adjust your course load or your workload, then you need to contact your advisor of studies as soon as possible to see what possibilities there are um, for you to adjust in future. We may not be able to adjust it immediately, depending on the time frame that you reach out to us, but we can certainly look at the whole scope of the program and see what flexibility there is to offer. Um, as I said before, for maternity or new parent needs or um, caregiving needs, reach out to your advisor at any point in time and we can see how we can support you. Um, if you decide that the program is just not the right fit for you or life throws so many challenges that you can't continue, um, the process of withdrawal is really quite straightforward. Just reach out to us um, and we can share information about this process. Do keep in mind that after certain points in time, you will still be liable for fees for the program. So within the first two weeks, you can withdraw without any financial liability. Um, but after that, there are a couple of fee liability deadlines that we can talk about um, if, if need be. Uh, if you join the program, but then decide you don't need to do the full MSc or you don't want to do the full thing, um, then we do have early exit awards. So at the end of year one or 60 credits, you will be eligible for a postgraduate certificate. And at the end of 120 credits, which is usually the end of year two, you'll be eligible for a postgraduate diploma as well. So it's always good to know that you don't necessarily have to do the entire thing 
if there is no need for you to do so. And there's more information. So some specific dates for you. Um, our induction week begins on the 11th of September. If you apply and you accept your offer, you will be invited to register and enroll usually around mid-August. Um, we'll send some emails so that you um, know what to enroll on and you know you have all the information that you need. Um, and during this induction week, we will do some induction sessions with you just to introduce you again to us, um, to give you a bit more overview and a bit more insight. And um, we'll provide some guides to help you access the different platforms that we use for the program. Uh, and then, do I did? No, I didn't do the right dates here. That should be the 18th, not the 28th of September. So the week one of teaching then begins the week after the induction week. So that is the 18th of September, not the 28th. Um, and that is when your first two weeks of content will be released. And then every two weeks after that, there will be two more weeks um, that you are welcome to engage with at your own pace. Uh, and there is some pre-arrival information as well um, at the link tree that I mentioned, but some of that might not make sense until you've been sent your um, registration and enrollment information by the university. So what I will do now is stop sharing. And I'll have a look at the chat. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or to turn your microphone on. Um, Gary. Yeah, so we always make sure that our textbooks are um, online and fully available through our library. Um, or if there are journal articles that are available through the library as well. Where possible, we also like to try and make sure that they are open source textbooks, um, just to give you that little bit more flexibility. Uh, I know some people really like to buy physical copies um, because that can be very expensive and quite prohibitive. We, we try and avoid that by giving the online fully accessible ones as much as possible. But if you ever have any issues, um, the library can support you in, in getting access to things uh, as well. They're a really, really great team. Um, Ravi, yes. So you will have access to everything at the Glasgow University Library. Um, some, People may, some universities have kind of partnerships um, with Glasgow, so I, I don't have a list, but um, I believe if you're a student at Glasgow, there are certain universities within the UK that you can actually go in and use their, their own physical library campus as well, but um, that might be something to check with the, um, the library team directly if need be. Um, John, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by enroll in person. This is a completely distance learning course. So there is nothing on campus um, like classes that you can attend. If there are events and seminars, welcome to attend those in person. But this is a fully distance learning version of this MSc. If you'd like to study an in-person program, there are full-time conversion programs um, that are linked from the link tree that I posted before. Uh, and I think... Uh, Danielle has kindly put at the top of this chat. We do have in-person uh, conversion MSEs, but they are full-time um, and there's no switching between the two. You're either full-time on campus or part-time on this distance learning program. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> we we get very complacent and use our acronyms for CHIP. Um, uh, Lampros, okay, the semester months, uh, semester one runs between uh, September and February, and then September two from February to mid-ish July. Um, that information is on the, the link tree as well. Um, uh, uh, Tony, the, so as part of the, um, once you join the university, you'll have a student account with Office 365. So we tend to um, 
use Office 365 and OneDrive for um, GDPR compliance and things like that. So other than that, your software of choice is entirely up to you in terms of completing your assessments. Uh, if you like to use Google, use Google, but you'll be uploading things in PDF or Microsoft Word and, and that kind of stuff. Um, the specific dates for 23-24 are not available, but um, as I mentioned before, semester one will start on the 18th of September, and that will run from uh, then until mid-July. The exact semester dates, the break weeks, the reading weeks, and the assessment deadlines will be available on day one, usually during the induction week, but if not, then day one of uh, week one, everything will be available to you as well. Um, will we have group assignments? Yes, Jana, the research methods um, courses, research methods one and research methods two, have one group uh, assessment each. Um, that's all we have at this point in time. And we try and do what we can to match people with time zones. Um, uh, and different things like that. We have a lot of really supportive um, tools in place to facilitate group work. And we don't do it really aside from those two research projects so that we're not creating additional burden. Uh, Rob, I emailed the learning development team a couple of months ago, but never had back. Um, uh, hmm. Interesting. Um, I would recommend maybe contacting your effective learning advisor within MVLS directly, but it may be that they need you to be registered and enrolled before they can offer you stuff. Or it may be as simple as because it's not a Glasgow email, often it gets immediately filtered into our junk box. So that may have been where your email landed. But certainly once you're registered and enrolled, um, you can make use of all the workshops and um, consultation hours and things like that that SLD offers. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Charlotte, why does the online course only offer part-time versus full-time in person? Um, I don't think there's a specific reason. The Yeah, I think it's just historically the decision that was made was the distance learning one would be the flexible online degree um, and so part time. Um, and I don't think the university offers any full time distance learning programs uh, and the full time course is on campus. Um, essentially, to make sure that people are minimizing their contact time. Um, and are just here for the year and not dragging it on. Um, I would actually add to that, Chiara, and actually say that it's because our online distance learning programs are suitable for those who are in full-time employment. So it's part-time. I would argue against that. but <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's, it's a lot of plates to juggle. Um, but a lot of our students who do online programs are also employed, whether that be part-time or full-time. Um, the courses are part time for people to have, uh, they, they may have other requirements out with their studies, so it just makes it a more flexible method of learning for our students. Yeah, we, for this particular program, we specifically don't recommend you work full full time, just because of the nature of the program, particularly if you have caregiving responsibilities so. Um, if there's any way that you can compensate some study hours as part of your um, work role, then we would strongly encourage it because it is quite a significant commitment. Um, but obviously, we all need to eat and live, <laughs> so working is a necessity as well. Um, but yes, do do consider the balance of that commitment if you have that option. Um, John, yes, as Danielle said, you can um, ask for a physical student card to be delivered to you if you are outside Glasgow. Um, the student services team can support that once you're registered and enrolled. Uh, and yeah, like I said, you can attend anything, events, seminars, workshops, university social events, the library, cafes, all that kind of stuff, uh, if you're based in Glasgow. Um, the application deadline, Vanessa, is the 31st 
of August. Um, if you already have a Bachelor of Psychology from another country, so a conversion program is intended for somebody with no prior psychological training or education. Um, if you are outside the UK, have a you have a, an undergraduate honors in psychology, but have been told by the BPS because you wish to move here and work here that you need to do a conversion program, then yes. If you're not moving to the UK and you're not intending to practice within the UK or under the BPS or be recognized by them, a conversion program will not benefit you in any way. Um, you'll want to look at specialist master's programs. So that is the distinction with conversion MSCs. Um, yeah, if, you, if the BPS has said, we don't recognize your prior training, so you need to come and do a conversion MSC, then yes, um, but it's worth contacting them just to see what they're um, what they will recognize and what they won't. Um, yes, uh, Lida. No, as I, I yeah, I mentioned this before, but research methods we have no expectations for any of our courses, not just research methods, that um, you have any prior knowledge of statistics or data skills or maths or anything like that. We start from the very very beginning. Obviously, if you have some prior contact and experience in these things that might support you that might facilitate uh, the learning but we have no expectations that you come with that having said that in the summer reading list that I provided um, it should have links to our data skills and research methods teaching books so if you're particularly anxious about it or you just kind of want to get a better idea of what it is you're going to learn you should be able to access those books now um, and you can just check it out and, and see what will be involved. Download the software and have a play if you want. Um, get ahead of the curve. That's up to you. Um, Caroline, so the, uh, the two assessments that involve short periods of great work and collaboration are Research Methods 1 and Research Methods 2. Um, it's not the main assessment for either course that involves group work. It's a minor assessment that then supports the larger assessment, which is individually submitted as well. Uh, Sharon, you will be contacted um, around August with some information to support your registration and enrollment. And then um, within the induction week, you're welcome to contact uh, your advisor. We will be touching base to everybody. Um, but we won't individually contact every student, um, but you're welcome to, to come to office hours and to reach out if you have any questions or any support, but you won't hear from us until um, the registration and enrollment process starts within August. Christina, yes, please do come and explore the beautiful architecture. Uh, Ravi, yes, we have quite a few people that are based in London. Um, that are already on the program. So, um, Colin, uh, I've included some information on this question in the FAQ document. There are potentially opportunities to collaborate with other organizations or other schools for your dissertation, but this is entirely contingent on the advice and agreement of your supervisor. Um, and generally speaking, it is not something I would necessarily recommend in a formal capacity. Um, informally, working with other researchers, great. Um, but the more elements that you bring in like that outside of the dissertation process, the more opportunities there are for potential um, uh, extra challenges uh, and things that can disrupt the timeline and the progress of your dissertation. For example, um, we had a student that made great progress with all the internal milestones, but because they wanted to work with an external school, it threw off their progress by three months. That is half the dissertation gone. So no matter how well you plan these things, you can't control uh, other review committees, external organizations, 
Um, and we had one student who did all the right things, but then the external organization turned around eight weeks later and said no. So I would very, very much to de-risk all these projects and to make them manageable. I would take your supervisor as the supervisor's advice and be very cautious um, about what you do within the scope of that time because the important thing is that you complete the dissertation and you do as well as you possibly can. Um, obviously, we want you to enjoy it and we want it to be a great experience. But in terms of progressing beyond this MSC, don't give yourself any more challenges than you might already uh, be facing just as part of the dissertation process. So don't get too many expectations about the dissertation now. It's at least two or three years away. Um, but, you know, keep those things in mind, but don't form any rigid expectations about them because we don't want you to be disappointed, essentially. Um, Helen, are grades important when wanting to continue education in psychology? This, uh, I mean, yes, in many cases, yes. If you're going for very um, competitive programs after this, so things like the DCLIN is very, very competitive. So having a good GPA will be helpful, but it is not the sole determining factor. Um, your other experience and your other volunteering work and your other kind of personal background is just as relevant. Um, so it's always good to do as best you can, but very rarely is an opportunity gate kept by a particular GPA. Um, but like I said, if you're going for something that is very competitive, then that could be um, something to keep in mind. But there are always lots of other pathways within psychology. Uh, Catherine, it's my understanding this course is necessary. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned before, the BPS careers information um, is really the best place to start to see all the different um, pathways that you can take. And they also have an opportunity to see what universities are accredited and what programs are accredited by them. Um, so I... I thought the School of Education offers um, a doctorate in educational psychology, not just Dundee. So that might be worth having a look at their website to see. Um, we don't, we also offer the, the DCLIN, but not within our school. So it might be worth starting at the BPS website to see what programs they accredit themselves and then seeing what other Scottish universities lie within that. Um, within our school, we only have uh, specialist research monsters training after this, but the School of Health and Wellbeing can offer the DCLIN, and I think the School of Education offers the EdSci um, doctorate as well, but don't quote me on that. I know a lot about the conversion MSc, but <laughs> so many other programs. Um, in terms of postgraduate studies, future pursuits, Um, yeah, like I said, have a look at the careers website for the BPS to see all the different types. We don't track our graduate outcomes, so I can't give you any um, percentages or approximate numbers of where our students go because it's just not data that we have. Um, I know a few people that I'm still in contact with, but um, that's only a small fraction of the number of people that we have. Uh, of those people, I know a few people go to assistant psychologist positions. Um, some do apply for the DCLIN, but as I said, it's very competitive. Um, a couple have gone to counselling and education, but a lot of people are actually supplementing their current career with additional qualifications by doing the MSc, not necessarily pursuing BPS programs. So we have lots of people that do this for lots and lots of different reasons. Um, and yeah, like I said, we don't track outcomes because we just don't have that data available to us. Uh, Ravi, yes, the year two optional courses must be part of our program. They can't just be anything within the university. They need to be within our accredited program uh, or they won't count. Um, 
John, which elements of the course will be most relevant for, because this is a BPS conversion program, like I said, it is very, very broad. So all of it will probably be relevant, um, but it is not specifically focused on, on any one specialism within psychology. So this is really about building the foundation of all your psychological knowledge before stepping into more specialist programs. Um, potentially, it sounds like you're interested in industrial organizational psychology. This is not something that's covered within a conversion MSc. Um, but underlying all of that industrial and organizational psychology are things like cognitive psychology, social psychology, um, human development, and those are things that we do cover within the degree. Um, uh, Sharon, depending on who your supervisor is, there may be opportunities to use MATLAB for um, uh, analyzing neuroscience and neuropsychological data. It really depends. It's not part of our core um, teaching is to provide um, learning and experiences with MATLAB. We use R for research methods, um, but yeah, we have supervisors who will offer secondary data analysis for some students um, using things like MATLAB or, or other software programs that you're welcome to, to try if you like. Um, in year two, what sort of paper options are available for semester two? Uh, Vanessa, you might need to give me a little information about what you mean by paper options. Um, so, unless you mean assessments, um, these are usually essays. Um, can I ask people? Oh, Vanessa, is that you? Yeah, that's me. Hi. Hi. Hi, thanks for, um, you know, asking my question. Um, yeah, so you say in year two that in semester two, there's um, option one and option two. I was just wondering what do you mean by option one and what option two? Like what type of papers? Oh, those um, are the courses that I mentioned before, the educational psychology, forensic psychology, um, clinical health, applied qualitative methods. Uh, and the current issues in psychology. Those are the option courses. Oh. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Thank you. No worries. Um, May. Um, we've been delivering this since 2017. Um, I've been involved since 2017. <laughs> um, so in terms of things that you can do to supplement um there are whatever kind of local volunteering opportunities you think are relevant to your future career pathways um yeah it kind of depends on what your interest is i guess um i wouldn't recommend exploring academic opportunities just yet i would wait until you have a year or two experience so that you can contribute to um, volunteer research opportunities with the right skill set uh, but yeah, whatever kind of volunteering opportunities you think are relevant to where you'd like to go, um, it's definitely worth exploring those. Nara, could I ask you a question, please? Sure. Is that okay? Um, so I'm a primary school teacher and I was trained in Ireland and I see that a lot of the courses are offered by the School of Education. And in Ireland, um, psychology would be a core part of our program. So is it is are those courses offered to primary school teachers in Scotland or are they um, different for the students on this course? So the, the courses that are led by the School of Education, um, those courses are specific to psychology MSc conversion. So we have three conversion programs at the university um, and all three are shared between the School of Psychology and Education but all of the courses on those programs are tailored specifically for conversion. Lovely, thank you very much, very no interesting. Um, da, 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 just looking at the chat. Um, we are over one o'clock, but I'll see if I can clear the questions on the, the chat. Um, yes, Yana, as I said, the we don't track um, outcomes after graduation. Um, but in terms of giving you graduation rates, 
I don't know of a single person that hasn't completed the MSc and hasn't graduated. We've had quite a few people that have just decided to take the early exit awards, um, but it, it can't really give an idea of uh, graduation rate is it's it's quite a complex index um, and we don't track uh, distinction and merits. Um, that I'm not aware that any further study requires, they, they usually just require an MSc, not necessarily a distinction or a credit. Um, I might be wrong, but I've never seen that to be the case. Um, GC, yes, the, the 2 1 honours requirement is a necessary, it's a central criteria for the university um, to be part of this program. If you don't have a 2 1, but you do have uh, additional masters or MBA or PhD, then that can supplement the 2 1 requirement. Uh, but no postgraduate certificate or diploma can supplement. Um, not having the two one. Um, no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for your time. I can't see any further questions. Um, but please do have a look at those Linktree resources. Um, have a look back at the recording. Um, and if you have any questions that we haven't covered today or aren't covered in that um, uh, Linktree resources, then please do reach out. So yes. Thank you, Stephen, for coming. Thank you, Daniel, for um, organizing. Um, and hopefully we'll see you very soon.